When I was about 10 or 12, we moved into a trailer park. And I was still kind of a good kid. All of my friends and neighbors used drugs and drank and did a lot of things that I didn't think were right. But soon I started doing what they did. Right up here around the corner is my former drug dealer. From the time I was 12, he was if we could gather up the money, he'd run to the liquor store for a couple bucks and get us some liquor. Then he began to sell us marijuana and mescaline and cocaine and whatever else we wanted. Well, this is, uh, this is where I grew up. This is, it was hard to find because everything's changed a little bit. We had a trailer that sat here. I found it by those trees my mother planted. I remember those out the back door. I didn't realize how small my little place we lived in was. I took care of a man who lived in here. He was a police officer who was shot and was paralyzed. I used to come over and vacuum his floor and make him some tea and make his dinner and his wife was never home. And I used to steal money from him. I'd write checks out of his checkbook and steal his um, prescription drugs and get high on them. And he knew I was doing it, but he didn't care because I was the only one who came over. Spent a lot of years wishing to die when I was here. When I stand here, I think about the fact that our life was so crazy and, and chaotic and my mother would scream and, and uh, throw me around the house and thinking about the neighbors, I remember saying, why isn't someone helping me? You're right next door, everyone can hear this, the whole neighborhood hears this going on. And it was just a sad little place to live. I had a mother, she was abused and neglected don't exactly know why, but it led to her being removed from her home and put into another family's home. And somebody in the household raped her. And as a result of that rape, I was born. She was removed from the home after she became pregnant. So she was on the street, living in the streets of Toledo. Um, with that, she took her abuse and her anger out on me. She kind of modeled what she had learned with her family. So I grew up as early as I can remember knowing that I was the result of a rape. She began to tell me I was ugly, I was stupid, and said very cruel, very mean things. And quite often would just sit up in the, in the living room all night long. I would hear her just screaming and crying. When I was about a year old, my mom married a man who later adopted me. She had a child with my adopted father. And when he came into the world, he was her everything. And uh, she made it very clear that was her child. I was not. I was supposed to stay in my room. I wasn't allowed to play with him, touch him, look at him. She, uh, you know, continued to say, you make me sick. I can't stand to look at you. Go away. You know, why don't you run away? Why don't you kill yourself? And I felt pretty bad about it. I felt like it was my fault. My mom was hurting and was crying all the time. Soon my mother and father couldn't get along and they divorced. I remember riding the bus and getting to the point where I would wake up with the shakes in the morning and would drink so I could go to school and try not to drink too much because if I drank too much, I'd have to leave school. Ultimately was kicked out for good. They, they wouldn't let me back. I was suspended forever. At that point, I was, uh, you know, just going to party it away, and, and who cares, and my life's ruined, and there's nothing I'm ever going to be able to do about it. I began stealing, breaking into people's 
trailers and breaking into homes and doing what I could to find money to supply my drugs and alcohol. And then I met a girl and she came from a home. Her mother had killed herself in the middle of their home. And so she was a pretty mixed up girl. Her dad was a drug addict who worked at Ford. And so he would send home $1,000 checks a week to pay the bills, pay for the car, pay for the food. And her and her little sisters lived in the home. So I moved in with her and was kind of, we played house for a while. I felt loved for the first time. I felt like there was somebody that was kind of as messed up as me and loved me anyway. I had a job working midnights and I got off early one night and came home and found her with somebody else in the bed with her. So I just left and went out and uh, just drank all day long and came back later that night, kicked the door in, began to scream and yell and attack her and her friend was over and I attacked her friend and the police came and I, I proceeded to get violent with the police and grabbed a guy around the throat. They beat me up and it was a really, really, really ugly night and I went home that night to my mother, I had a really ugly episode with my stepdad, who my mom had married late in my teen years. I flipped the fridge, I threw TV sets, I broke windows, I went berserk. And it really was just, um, thinking back on it, it was me saying, does anybody see how broken I am? Does anybody see how much pain I'm in? Does, does anybody care? I saw she had a mental hospitals phone number and she was going to have me admitted and I didn't want to go to a mental hospital, I didn't want to go to jail, I had nowhere to go so I decided I was going to take my life that night and um, remember this, this peace that came over me like <laughs> I'm not going to hurt anymore. I'm not going to have any more pain. Nobody can hurt me. No, I can't hurt anyone else. And uh, um, I felt so relieved and so overjoyed uh, that I had control, that I could end it, that, you know, everyone would be better without me. My family would stop hurting. There was no one going to miss me. I had guns, but my mother had taken the ammunition. I left to go get the ammunition, and I went up my stairs and got to my door, and as I... <laughs> As I approached my door, there was a man uh, walking up to my door. He was a pastor who was just going door to door, trying to build his church and his youth group. So as I ran into him, I really sat there going, is this God? Is this coincidence? Did this guy just show up out of nowhere? Who called him? Who told him to come here? And um, But something in me said, maybe, just maybe God was saying, I'm here and I know you're hurting and I do care and you're not alone. So I invited him in and took the chance to just kind of let him talk to me and maybe he's got something I haven't heard before is kind of what I thought. I thought I have nothing to lose if this goes bad, if this turns out to be a joke, if this is, is meaningless and fake, um, you know, I, I reserve the right to go back to my other plan. He began to talk to me about God. Um, you know, I didn't know who God was to me. Um, if God was a man, I didn't know any good men to model after. And he began to open the Bible and talk to me about God and, and began to tell me that there's a God that loves me. And so we prayed together and he spent the entire day helping me understand the significance of what had happened and that I truly was, you know, forgiven of all the horrible, terrible, bad, bad things I had done. Some people in our church said, well, you can come clean stalls at our horse farm and we'll pay you some money. And one of the things that happened is I was there, a lot of quiet time to think about me and my life. And I was just uh, piling the manure in the wheelbarrow or whatever. And I felt very strongly that God was saying to me, I needed to take some steps beyond the fact that he forgave me to, to you know, make amends and make it right. An opportunity presented itself that very night uh, I went home and uh, a friend had been questioned over some crimes that I had committed. So I went to the state police and said, I'm here to turn myself in. Didn't want to do it, was very afraid of it, but felt so clearly that God said to do this, that it was the right thing to do and that I had done wrong and, and, 
in man's eyes, I needed to pay some consequence for that. They videotaped me and they audio taped me and they took notes and they took me from home to home where I had stolen things. As I did, the charges continued to grow. I went through this whole process of faith and fear. God asked me to do this. He's not going to destroy me, um, but I might be going in a really crazy direction here soon. As the court date approached, um, you know, I went in really um, anticipating prison time. The prosecutor's recommendation was that I would spend 12 years in prison. And I went into court and watched grown men with families that did far less than me go to jail. And so I, I pretty much decided in my heart, I'm going to start a prison ministry today. My attorney messed up everything, and, and everything he tried, he did wrong. He got scolded by the judge, and so it didn't look good. And uh, the judge asked me to speak, and I said, I turned myself in because I did wrong, and I deserve whatever punishment you bring. You're the judge. I trust your wisdom and direction. I do want to say that I am a new creation today. I am a new person. I've asked Christ into my heart. He's forgiven my sins. He's given me a new life. He's washed me white as snow, and uh, I am... <laughs> I'm going to tell the world who he is and what he's done for me. And if you leave me on the streets, I can promise you I will be on the streets telling everyone I can find. And if you put me behind bars, I'm going to tell them how much God loves them and that their life can be different, even there. I remember it like uh, it was the first time really telling a whole group of people, you know, about my faith and being so scared. And the lady typing it is almost like she stopped and looked at me, and, and I just felt like everyone was just staring at me, and judge kind of rubbed his chin. And he says, no, I don't think you deserve to be to prison. Um, he says, I'm going to go a different route. And he gave me five years probation, and he did convict me of one felony. I didn't understand the significance of that until later. I was released to go home and go to probation once a month. So I decided to get my GED and went back to college and graduated my associate's degree with a 3.9 and went on to Eastern Michigan University into accounting. As I neared the end of my college career, they told me you cannot become a CPA with a misdemeanor on your record. And in the meantime, I was doing invisible fence sales and I was sitting in this little elderly lady's home and just felt a nudge to share with her what Jesus had done in my heart and how my life had been turned around. She invited me back to dinner her husband wasn't really happy that a salesman was there for dinner. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I told him, I said, I was sharing with your wife. I think that's why she invited me back. So and, uh, I told him my story. And he began to have tears wipe, run down his face. And he was wiping them away and, and didn't really know the significance of what was going on. And he says, young man, he says, I'm a judge. He told me, I can expunge your record. He was excited to help. He had a friend who was a Christian friend who offered me a great deal price-wise to get the legal paperwork done. I remember very specifically sitting at my kitchen table when these big envelopes that came in the mail. <laughs> it was the state police and FBI files of my fingerprint records. It, it came back to me. It was given to me. It was taken out of the computer and they says, your, your record has been wiped clean. And <laughs> I literally just uh, fell on my face and uh, worship God. That was the beginning, and uh, honestly, it was a short amount of time I received a call from a firm, and they said, would you like to come work for us? So I went on board and began this journey as a CPA in this whole new world. And it was kind of weird for me, because everybody was quite a bit different, and I knew my past and my background, and felt like a fish out of water a little bit. I remember moving up the ladder and, and moving along and getting my first management, real management position. So we went in this room, there was about 40 people in the room, and they began to share how they built their business through partying and going to the bars and taking clients to strip clubs. They asked me and I said, well, I'm, I'm kind of thinking I'm going to build my business uh, through some breakfasts and some lunches with um, some people who are Christian, and in the evenings I'm going to go home and be with my family. One guy in particular fell off his chair to make a scene laughing at me and trying to humiliate me in front of everybody. Instantly, my phone began to ring. A clients with six, eight clients associated with them were coming through the door. At the end of the year, I stood in front of 400 plus people in front of my entire company and received an award for the most new business that year. 
the grand prize for that was a trip to my boss's million dollar condo on the ocean in the Turks and Caicos Islands. The senior pastor at the church I was attending came to me and offered me a position to work at the church. I said, well, this is a big step for me. God's got to lay it on my heart. So he didn't tell anyone at the church. Only him and I knew. In my heart, I knew it was what I wanted to do. This was a considerable step back in pay and in future pay. And uh, it was a family decision that, that I really had to wrestle with. And uh, one of the first things that happened is I called a friend who was my hunting buddy who isn't a Christian and isn't a churchy. He's a man who says he doesn't believe in dreams. He's never really dreamt. And in the last two weeks, he's had two dreams that he was sitting in the church. And I was the pastor. Um, so it was very clear to him and I that this was God truly trying to, to say something. And even with that, I was still a little hesitant and afraid. The next thing that happened was that I had a call from a man I had helped. And he called me and he says, Tim, I just want you to know I was at this men's conference all weekend long and he said the clearest thing I'd ever heard in my life was that if to call you and tell you if you get a call to ministry that you need to take it. I decided then you know if I need to do this this is God's will for my life and so I came on board as the youth and family pastor. I remember sitting at my desk and going okay what's going to happen and my phone rang and it was somebody who was he called and heard I was a drug addict who had turned my life around and he said, I need to talk to someone, I'm hurting, I'm, I'm really bad. And I sat down and prayed with this man and led him to Christ and uh, got him into a Christ Center program and he began to grow and uh, um, that was my first day literally in my office and uh, it's been uh, an overwhelming, unbelievable journey ever since. My Mondays I do a Celebrate Recovery program for drug addicts and sexually abused and physically abused and emotionally scarred. People that are just at that point of brokenness and no hope. And then on Wednesday nights I have high schoolers and again a whole group of lost people really trying to get answers and looking for hope and looking for direction. That was the age when I started to really fall apart and when God came and rescued me. So those are two areas I'm very passionate about and, and care very much about. And to know beyond a shadow of a doubt what I have to offer is the answer to just have the ability to bring that as a career, if you can call it that, and it's overwhelming. I married the most amazing, beautiful woman I've ever known, and that's my wife, Gina. And I have, I have an eight-year-old son, Devin, I have a six-year-old daughter, Livia, and I have a four-year-old, Caden. Our house is full of joy and peace. They're the joy of my life. It's amazing. I never thought I could be a parent. I never thought I could have a happy home. My mother and I have restored our relationship. My mother has since come to the Lord. She is a, the most amazing grandmother you could ever ask for. The point that we really reconciled was a point when I had to forgive. We can talk today openly about the fact that there was abuse and there were things that were wrong and um, we can laugh we're okay with the past being the past, and we both healed and moved on. It's kind of awesome, but uh, our whole family's been blessed and restored and really living a great, wonderful, productive, healthy life together. So six or seven years ago, I sat in this very chair and uh, answered some questions about my life for a video that I assumed was going to be shown in a community college classroom. And really, the video itself transformed my life in that it took my story and kind of took it out of the shadows and thrust it into, uh, into the world, into a, a lot of places I didn't expect to be. I have been in front of the state senate and, and 
suicide and right to life groups and um, groups all over the place have asked me to come and speak and share my story because of that video. And prior to that, I wouldn't have shared it with, I don't know, my next door neighbor. I was very scared and timid and struggled to uh, be that real. The video has um, reminded me over and over again as I've been asked to share um, really how amazing it is that God has changed my life. And it forced me to be honest. It forced me to uh, be vulnerable. It forced me to um, allow people into places that you don't normally do that. And it's scary and frightening and even painful at times. What it's done uh, for other people and, and the hope it's brought and the lives it's changed. Um, I am so grateful. I can't imagine um, my life without it at this point. I wanted to share some more of my story and the continuation of what God's done. What I'm excited to say is that, that my mother and I have continued to uh, develop our relationship and our relationship has flourished and grown. I'm grateful every time I hear that story, my own story, that my mother gave me life when many moms wouldn't have and she chose to uh, allow me to live this life that I'm living now and I owe her everything for that. An amazing moment for my life was the day I was privileged to baptize my mother um, as a pastor, but also as her son, and uh, to celebrate um, what God has done in our lives together in that way. <clears throat> Something happened that I couldn't have ever dreamed of, and it was that I, I was introduced to my biological father and his family. He was in a hospital bed um, with a brain hemorrhage and was facing the end of his life. I realized when I met him that there was a longing and uh, I did have a lot of pain and mixed emotions that, you know, that was the father I didn't have and that was the, the man I, I wished I'd had. I sat at his bed and um, shared my story and um, and I had the privilege of encouraging him to take God's hand as he left this this life and as I left um, the the wife came down the hallway and got a hold of me and she asked me if I would be willing to perform a funeral service for him and a few days later they had taken him off life support and he had passed and um, I had the most amazing privilege of my life to stand to stand beside somebody that I once hated, somebody I once blamed and, and was very angry and bitter, but to stand there and share that day with them and to uh, be given the opportunity to be a son for a day like that and was just a privilege I couldn't have I just couldn't have dreamed. I couldn't have dreamed that I would be able to do something so powerful and that God would give me such an amazing moment. So my mother um, joined me at church one day and we had a guest speaker and the first words out of the mouth of this guest speaker were on March 24th, 1968, the Brighton Church of the Nazarene was born. And my mother turned to me and I turned to her and we both, um, we both started sobbing. And I'm sure we look crazy to the preacher guy, but um, that's my birthday. We realized that that was the day that she was birthing me in a hospital alone and afraid and crying out to a God she didn't even believe in at the time. Um, but to realize that I minister at a church that shares the same birthday as mine and just knowing that there's no accident, there's no doubt in our minds that God brought her to church that day so we could hear that side by side to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God had a plan and a purpose for my life. I am excited to find out what the next chapter of my life will be. I know this. I know that um, God has used my story in ways I couldn't have imagined and um, he's changing me. Every time I hear my own story, I'm reminded that, that there's a story still happening and unfolding. 
the, the greatest part of my life now is the ability to share it with others and to give to others and bring hope to others. I am grateful and blessed to sit here and to know that everything I've lived through was for a purpose and was for a reason. And the story is not mine. It is really a bigger story. It's a story about a God who loves us and came to redeem us and restore us and give us a hope and a future. When I tell my story, I'm really telling his story.